were I in a black Baptist setting, I would have to say giving honor to God and to the president and the, <laughs> and the whole nine yards. So I, uh, I will not do that. Let, let me thank you for that, that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I don't know about white Methodists, but white Baptists uh, take pride in having many people at prayer meeting. And that is something that black Baptists uh, normally could not say. But even last night, in the snow, we had 100 people in prayer meeting. Um, I am so delighted to have, we have four children, I'm so delighted to have one of our children with us today, and that's Monica. Monica, will you please stand? Yes. Monica runs my life, uh, she does. For some reason, I have no earthly explanation for it. I don't like doing these kinds of activities. I say no, no, when she tells me. I think um, we've turned down several already. Um, Brother Kalen, uh, got on the good side of Monica and paid her some money. <laughs> and she etched me in for today. I'm keenly aware that uh, Centenary is the oldest college west of the Mississippi, I believe, and the oldest in this city. I have a cousin who graduated from this school um, and she is now a practicing physician. So I, I do have some connection with this school. As a matter of fact, when uh, we got married 60 years ago, I uh, suggested to my wife that she come to Centenary. And at that time, the way I had been treated in this city, she wasn't sure how she would be treated here and decline. I'm going to tell her she needs to come to seminary. <laughs> Tim, thank you. Gosh, boy, you can sing. Bless you. Bless you. One last thing, and then I'll get to what my assignment. It's always a joy for me to look in the audience and see members of Mount Canaan. And uh, let me ask Mount Canaan members to stand, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to have my city councilman here today, Mr. Bradford, and there may be other elected officials. If so, Brother Bradford, will you stand and other elected officials who represent me, please stand with me. I've already told you that I've been married 60 years come August of this year. And when Norma and I celebrated our 50th anniversary, she said to Mount Canaan, these words I shall never forget. I have been a married widow for 50 years. <laughs> Serious indictment. She's, uh, she's uh, absent today because she's expected <laughs> to get well <laughs> from the flu. <laughs> now, had I said that in the black community, they would have gotten it. Y'all slow. <laughs> Nineteen thirty-four, October twenty-first. I was born in Arkansas. 
on a plantation. I have lived on three plantations. The Leland Plantation in Lake Village, Arkansas. The Ashley Plantation in Tallulah, Madison Parish. And the Woodsburg Plantation, 15 miles north of Shreveport, near Dixie, Louisiana. I was born to parents, my daddy never learned to read nor write. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to have to apologize to him that I didn't take the time to teach him to write his name. My daddy was a share cropper. Unlike the Bradfords, Bradford, I think, lived on, uh, in the country, on a farm. His daddy owned the land. My daddy was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. And I was doing some research that when slavery was abolished, white America didn't quite know what to do with blacks. And they labeled them as freedmen. But they needed work. And please forgive me, but as I see it, slavery was continued under another name. That's right. That's right. So really, as I look at my life and my history, I'm a part of slavery under another name. I lived on the plantation until 1959, 24 years old. I guess I would still be on the plantation if my wife had not asked me to marry her. <laughs> and she freed me from the plantation. That's my story. I have lived, I did live on the plantation until I was 24 years old. A slave under a new name, a different name. But even on the plantation, I saw things happening in America that did not make sense to me. I was sold a bill of goods that, that the white man's ice was colder, his sugar was sweeter. And one day I tasted the white man's sugar. It tasted just like my daddy's sugar. So then I thought, something is wrong with America. Why is it that I have to drink from a fountain designated for coloreds only? Why is it that I have to stand, I have to buy a ticket on a bus, for a bus, and go to the back when there's plenty of sitting room up front? What's wrong with me? What is it about me that I have to be castigated and told to sit in the rear when there's sitting room up front. Or stand, we didn't have McDonald's in that day, but stand like today on the outside of a window of a hamburger joint. Order a hamburger when others are sitting on the inside. 
and is handed to me by a waitress who didn't want to be bothered with me. I saw this and I knew something was wrong with this and I decided that I will do what I can to bring about a change. On this plantation, let me go back to the plantation. I happened to be living, my daddy, I guess, always chose a decent plantation owner. The plantation where I grew up on, the owner built a Baptist church and a Methodist church, Black Baptist building, and, and, and a Black Baptist and Black Methodist. And he put the public school in the ba Black Baptist Church. He selected that. I guess I'll have to do some research. I don't know how that was connected with the school system. The plantation owner selected the person who would be the teacher. My teacher was not really a college graduate. And she taught first grades through seventh grade, every subject. And I was promoted to the eighth grade, left the plantation school, and I was eighth grade before I had ever heard of eight parts of speech. Really didn't know what a fraction was, except it was a number written over the top of a number. In my second year after I left that school, I moved to Caddo Parish, ninth grade, thrown into the famous Book of Washington High School. And now I've got to compete with students who've been properly educated or, or at least better educated than me. And I literally sat up many times all night long trying to understand algebra, trying to conjugate sentences. And I was determined to learn decent grammar because I saw white folk laughing at black folk because they didn't get the verbs right. And even though I learned to speak de decent grammar, I was still treated like a second class citizen. Well, I made it through Booker Washington. How I made it, I have no earthly explanation and became the president of the largest graduating class in the history of Book of Washington. <laughs> My counselor said to me, Harry, where are you going to school just before I graduated? I said, well, I'd like to go to Moore House, but I was not prepared to go to any house. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me, my grandfather, who lives in Marshall, Texas, and she added, the school that I graduated from, Bishop College, is in Marshall, Texas at that time. He keeps students in his home. I want you to go and meet him. And I did. He said, I'd be happy to have you come. And then I proceeded to meet the president of that college and said to him, sir, I have no money, but I know how to work. And his response was, since you know how to work, I'll see you in September and I'll have a job for you. And he assigned me to the first lady of the college, his wife, to drive her and to work in the student center. And I put so many work hours in school that when I graduated, the school owed me money that they never paid me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And, and this is the truth. I was not, I don't know how I got in school because I couldn't have passed the college entrance test. But God gave me two teachers I remember. I fondly remember when I made a D on the text, test. Both of those teachers would put D slash C minus and the C got on my transcript. And when I got to thinking about it, when I became 50 years old, God said to me, those were grace grades. And now here I stand in Centenary College to tell my story. Upon graduating in 1959 from college, Martin King was my commissioned speaker. I had read his book, Stride Towards Freedom, which chronicled the bus boycott movement in Birmingham, Alabama, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Plus, I was familiar with the late Dr. T.J. Jemison, pastor of Mount Zion First Baptist, Baton Rouge, had already successfully done a bus boycott in Baton Rouge, in my state. I later learned that Dr. King came to Dr. Jemison and modeled the Montgomery bus boycott by what had been done in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dr. C.O. Simpkins, who incidentally, the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization, was organized in Louisiana New Zion Baptist Church, New Orleans. Dr. Simpkins was on his board and in 1959 and said to Dr. King, there's a young man in my city. I want you to hire him as a field director and assign him specifically to Shreveport to help blacks become registered voters and to teach them to pass the test and what was required to become registered voters. On March 1st, I was interviewed and became the first field director of SCLC, assigned to Shreveport. Went to work March 1st, March 2nd, I was arrested. Arrested. Harry Blake arrested. My daddy could not read or write. He was he never had an arrest record. How am I gonna handle this? Now I got an arrest record. And let me tell you how that came about. The city fathers of Shreveport knew that I had been hired by Dr. King, wanted to talk with me rather than ask, making an appointment, they arrested me. And uh, the chief of police said to me, Reverend Blake, you have a bright future in Shreveport and you should not be bothered, be connected with that communist king and uh, if you tell me that you are going to resign and not work with him I'll release you if not I'm going to arrest you and I reached my hands out for him to put cuffs on them because I decided I would not let someone di dictate my morals or my values. 
I, did, I didn't think it was famous. I didn't keep records of how many times I was arrest, arrested in Shreveport. I'll give you two accounts. One time, I think it was the last time Dr. King spoke in Shreveport, his uh, executive director, Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, was here. And the Ku Klux Klan were picketing at Dr. King's speech at Little Union Church. And Dr. Walker and I went out to see what was going on, and the policeman said, uh, Hey, boys, y'all go back in the church. And of course, Dr. Walker, being a Yankee, uh, didn't respond to that well. Your boys, with me being a Southerner, I thought I would go. He said, Harry, we have the freedom to be out here. And we were told twice to go in church, and we did not, and we were arrested. Kept in jail for three days on the mental observation. And of course, my wife said, I have not been cleared of that charge yet. <laughs> To make a story, long story short, fast forward, when the girls in Birmingham, Alabama were killed, President Kennedy uh, announced that the subsequent Sunday would be a Sunday, a day of mourning, and encouraged blacks all over America to have memorial services. I went to Commissioner Joy's door toys to get a permit to march. We would march from Booker, Washington to Little Union Church, just about two blocks, three blocks apart. I solicited the permit on Monday I was called Saturday noon to say that the permit to march is denied. The commissioner said to me, now what are you going to do? I said, well, commissioner, you had five days to make your decision, and you're only giving me five seconds. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know later. He said, well, I'll tell you this. If anybody marches in that march, on Sunday, they will be arrested. And of course, Commissioner George Dortoys was a man of his word. And may I add parenthetically, the white community really did not appreciate or did not understand his action toward the blacks until he came to your campus. And I, I don't remember what dorm it was in and beat up some of your white students. And then the white community took notice that George Dortoys uh, may be what the blacks say he is. Back to my story. I did not want, and I knew he would do it, I didn't want unsuspecting people, blacks, to get arrested and lose their jobs. Because Mr. Dortoys had a way of trying to keep the black community under his control. He would put a person in our, in our rallies and in our private meetings um, with the surveillance, and they would record the meetings, and he would have them transcribed and if anyone was in that meeting who worked for a company in this city, didn't have a lot of companies, it was reported to the president of that company, uh, this black man who works for you was at this rally, uh, civil rights rally, fire him. Mm -hmm. And even the superintendent of schools monitored school teachers. And I went through a period, and I understood it quite well, that it was dangerous to be seen with me. And, and if blacks saw me coming on one side of the street, they would get on the other side. I understood that. I understood that quite well. 
Well, I wanted to inform the committee or the public that we will not have the rally. We, we, we're not going to have the march. We'll just assemble it at uh, New Orleans, at uh, New Union Church. And before Mr. George Dortor has found out this is Saturday, the next day Sunday, he had garnered law enforcement people all over this parish, all over the city, and Little Union, Milam Street looked like a war zone. At the end of the service, we wondered how would we get out because they had mounted policemen with bayonets, with cow prods, and the late attorney Jesse Stone went and negotiated with Mr. Dortoys to let us come out two by twos. I was on the phone trying to get the Justice Department to let them know what was going on with others. And I happened to walk to the vestibule of the church. Mr. George Toys, with two other policemen were in the vestibule of the church, came and manhandled me and began to beat me, drug me outside of the church, and every policeman who could get a piece of my head with his nightstick beat me until they thought I was dead or appeared to be lifeless and left me lay on the ground in front of the church, September 22nd, 1960, what was it? 63, thank you. That's my Shreveport story. I'll close by saying this. Before I signed on to work with Martin King, I went to my dad, my parents, and said to them what my decision was. And I informed my daddy that I may get killed, but you may get killed or injured also because I'm your son. And I want to apologize to you for making this decision that may bring harm to you. And my daddy, who could not read or write, a tenant farmer said to me, I would be disappointed if you made any other decision. And he literally went through hell. My siblings, who are much younger than I, remind me that everywhere my daddy went, he was stopped by policemen and cursed out, never beaten, but cursed out, intimidated. But my daddy uh, had no education, but was a man of integrity and a man of courage, and whatever I am, it's because of what he bequeathed. To me. That's my story. You you heard enough. Bless you.